advocates, friends, and clients from Hemp Engineering. It is a great pleasure having today Mr. Robert Sinner with us. He's based in Toronto, Canada. It, um, is, his main focus in the hemp industry is um, something that calls my attention very much and a lot of clients around the world because of his work in artificial intel intelligence perspective. It is something, Mr. Robert, that uh, I am, as an engineer, I am very amazed and I'm very keen to listen to you. Welcome. How did you end up in the hemp industry? Well, uh, I ended up in the hemp industry because of my background in the lumber industry. And uh, we were in the, the family business was in the uh, distribution of uh, lumber and building materials. And uh, I was looking for a way to increase our margins, uh, give us the opportunity to be more competitive in the marketplace, to increase our economies of scale. I came across secondary wood processing. I spent many years developing our secondary wood processing operations as a means of gaining some margin. It was very nice and we used that additional margin to penetrate the markets with lower prices. At the same time though, eventually it got frustrating. We were growing, but our margin wasn't able to grow because in order to capture more market, in the commodity world, we had to do it by reducing our margin. So from that point, I became interested in automation. And this was in the late 1980s. And I was reading a magazine about General Electric's factory automation group. They had just finished the implementation of the world's first completely computer driven um, operation. It is a General Electric's, it was General Electric's fact, uh, locomotive assembly plant in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. And I became very interested in the way that they described it because I envisioned it very similar uh, in a sense to what we do, what we were doing for the secondary processing. I contacted General Electric and uh, discussed what they were doing, what I was interested in doing. And we partnered in the development of an AI driven computer integrated manufacturing application for secondary wood processing. And we traveled to uh, Sweden to Finland to Norway, we looked at different technologies. And the idea originally had been for General Electric to build this facility in Manitoba, Canada, to fulfill an economic offset from the turbine generators they had sold to Manitoba for an uh, electrical generation facility. Mm -hmm. Jack Welch came in as the chief executive officer of General Electric, and he changed their focus from factory automation to finance. So they were no longer involved in the project, but I patented it myself in 1991. Mm -hmm. And in 1995, we started to build our facility with our new facility starting in 1997 we were able to increase our sales from $37 million to $240 million by 2001. Now, the reason I tell this story is how significant an impact AI and intelligent manufacturing can have on a fiber processing operation. My background in wood processing became critical in my understanding of what I expected to be able to achieve in the hemp processing world. And in essence, what we have done to date is developed an AI driven smart factory, which is the modern way of saying computer integrated manufacturing for 
hemp stock processing. And we redefine the economics of hemp stock processing by transforming it into hemp fiber optimization. Which That's as an introduction. Which is uh, the, the, the basis itself is a um, game changer for the potential factories that we can have from the moment that we harvest to even start producing, you know, products, final products as that's very revolutionary. Well, you know, it, it, I can tell you it, it redefined the secondary wood processing industry. It's redefined um, many manufacturing. Almost all new manufacturing today is built around some type of AI application okay. for a specific type of processing or manufacturing. And in fact, I can tell you that China in the last three years has made 600, 600 times the number of applications that have been made in the US for AI applications. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So, I mean, AI is um, an area where if you have a specific application and you can build some intellectual property around it with the AI, you have a, um, a patentable opportunity, but it redefines uh, really the economics of the entire process. I believe somehow that the uh, engineering behind the idea is technolog technologically advanced um, and, um, and it, it will make a change in, 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 in many areas. And yet I believe that somehow the prohibition is still uh, giving uh, headaches or obstacles for this to materialize. What do you think? I'm sorry, who's giving the headaches? The prohibition era, the, the prohibition. Well, you know, uh, in different parts of the world, certainly it would have a uh, greater impact. In Canada, hemp has been completely legal since 1998. Uh, most of the uh, initial set of restrictions were reduced or eliminated. Uh, you know, recognizing that you're dealing with a substance which has no THC, is non-psychotropic, and um, really, I, I, at this point, you know, it's unfortunate for government. Uh, I say that government is often blind because they keep their eyes so tightly shut. Uh, they don't want to see. They don't want to understand. They want to play to a populace which is not educated specifically and not interested in learning. It's no different when it comes to drugs than it is to hemp, than to food, than to energy, than to sustainability. These are all basic realities that people choose not to want to see. I want to reinforce your thinking, Mr. Robert, because the, a couple of days ago, I was giving also another, um, another uh, we were doing another interview with another Canadian. Um, um, we were talking also these the clashes between the politics and the science. These clashes has been happening since the time of the church when they cut the head off of um, Copernicus when he says that the, that the earth was not the center of the universe. And, and in fact, it, it was, we were or, you know, going around the earth, uh, around the sun and that caused his head. So <laughs> I think uh, we have a very similar situation in, in this moment. A lot of good minds are, you know, uh, being, silence or else by government that they do not want to listen to the truth of this marvelous plant. Mr. Robert, tell us about your projects, your dreams, what you're after. I, this, I believe that you must be having a lot of clients that are knocking on your doors or 
If not, I would love this video to reach as many clients as we you can manage. Ramon, you know, every coin has two sides on it. And one of the key elements of our project and our focus on developing the technology was that it be volume oriented. At the same time, it's volume oriented, but it's highly scalable. That's one of the benefits of having a facility, not just the system, but the facility is 100% digitally controlled. So in that level, it's an almost an autonomous system in that it makes its own decisions, it defines its own process, and it schedules its own production. Uh, it's very sophisticated for a world that is just entering this industry. And the reality is, from that perspective, it's more expensive than just a large scale facility because it is driven by advanced systems uh, that are quite expensive. But having said that, you know, the minimum hourly rate that we pay uh, in our pro formas is $17 US plus a full 24% benefits to the employees. We pay the farmers up to $250 per ton for their stock. And we still make 47% EBITDA. On our $50 million of projected revenue, we show a $22 million EBITDA. It's a very, very profitable paradigm when you focus on optimization. Yes. You know, it's interesting when you think about Elon Musk and developing the Tesla automobile or developing the SpaceX rocket, mm -hmm. the technology gives him great flexibility. What it allows him to do is it allows him to virtualize what he wants to create digitally. And then he can transform that digitization into an actual reality. It's a very, very productive paradigm when you understand <clears throat> how the technology pieces fit together. Uh, he has a, an unbelievable intuitive sense to be able to make that determination, uh, both in the car industry and in the rocket industry. Yes. You know, I love to tell the story that Elon Musk developed his SpaceX rocket originally on a video game. Video games today are pure AI. Yes. They have all the physics and the engineering built right into the software to operate in real time. And that's how they're able to do what they do. And so, intelligence is the base of everything, my man. <laughs> you know, from, from our point of view, uh, probably about a year ago, I realized that I wasn't really in the digital, I, re I wasn't really in the hemp fiber business. I was in the hemp fiber data business. Our whole focus is the analysis of the fiber so that we can actually provide some type of objective quality rating or quality control. And we can match that up to the specific criteria expectations of our clients. Otherwise, everything is about promises and expectations where there isn't any objective criteria really mm -hmm. to make the determinations. Okay. You know, we think that in this day and age, it's just, it makes no sense to go into any type of manufacturing or processing that doesn't give you the flexibility uh, that you would have in any type of processing or manufacturing operation. I don't know, for example, Ramon, you as an engineer, if you've ever seen some of these 
automated plastic recycling um, operations where they feed all the different types of plastic through at once and different types of scanners operate to separate out the polypropylene from the polyethylene and they do it you know while the the pieces are flying by them at 40 50 miles an hour mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know the the type of flexibility that technology provides today i think is something that a lot of people don't really either understand or appreciate i mean when we think about how much power we have in our cell phones how much power we have not from a torque point of view but from a uh an intelligence point of view um in our automobiles uh in in you know in in so many tools in, in computers obviously but but we don't appreciate what how that translates into the iott world the internet of technical things mm. where you can connect things digitally and even if they're not of the same generation, then that's where the IOTT comes in as opposed to the IOT. You get broad range communications so that you connect old things with new things. And then you have the straight IOT, which is just, you know, something like uh, the uh, smart locks on doors or the smart alarm systems. They're connected, but they're connected within their one small network. They're not designed to expand, uh, to create a, a full network solution. So we believe that having a full network solution is critical. We believe that when you're dealing with the natural fiber industry, you're always taking the risk of nature. You know, they say in a conventional decortication plant, you can't justify driving more than two hours from the facility to the farm. They say that outside of that, it's not economic. So that gives you a two hour or 120 mile radius around your facility. Well, what, so that would mean that would be most where most of your stock would come from, from your, your feedstock. Yes. But what would happen if there was a hurricane in that area or a tornado or a drought? Or flooding. <laughs> or whatever, yes. then you're wiped out. Our model is because we have digital integration throughout to build a minimum network of five facilities, all digitally controlled across North America, a minimum of five in five years. And that would be Canada, the United States and Mexico. And that would allow the opportunity for situations where there were problems in one zone, the order would be automatically directed to one of the other facilities to fulfill because the system would know exactly what quality bales it had in inventory and what quality bales and characteristics the customers expected. So from an uh, customer centric point of view from a customer service point of view we think that that's a critical benefit where they know they'll be able to have the reliability and the consistency that they need for their operations the other interesting thing about our automated quality control system ramon is that because it tracks every bail that goes through the system and it analyzes every bail in terms of its output and results what it's actually able to do is track all of the production that comes from a specific bale. And in that way, we can actually track what the average yield per bale per farmer is. And in that way, we can see which farmers we get the highest value stock from relative to our needs. Mm -hmm. Mm, mm, mm. And all the data on each farmer is provided to us at the end of the harvest season. So it says what varietals they grew, 
when they were planted, when they were harvested? Was it green or dry, uh, green uh, irrigated, or was it dry land? If it was irrigated, how often, how much? Were there fertilizers, how much, how often? And then the system takes the top five farmers that, that, that it analyzed gave you the best yield. It takes all of their variables in the agronomic equation that they provide and uses machine learning to go through these doing a reverse statistical analysis and coming up with what the optimum agronomic equation would be. And then we give that to the farmers to help them become more productive. Agree. 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 So, um, not only this, uh, Mr. Robert, is just um, um, it will help uh, to the decision makers take the proper decisions when deciding to allocate the products to a, to a certain factory to complete the process. Yes. If it if if it's required because artificial intelligence can do it by itself, <laughs> basically. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, you know, you know, I I always like to point out because one question people ask is, well, what's the risk? So I like to address the fact that all the technology that we use, all the equipment, all the machinery, all the systems, they are all proven in existence operating in existing processing or manufacturing environments. They're all large scale and automated. And because they're automated, which means they're run by a PLC, a programmable logic controller for that particular line, we can use our direct control system, our DCS, in order to take over the, the PLCs. So mm -hmm. our brain takes over their brain. And that allows us the full system integration that we have to give us the flexibility to be able to fulfill a low cost production. I guess one of the questions uh, we will have to address in the near future after we reach that level of um, implementation is what are we going to do with the people? Uh, what are we going? What companies are going to invest their money for the people? <laughs> Somehow, I support artificial intelligence a hundred percent, but I also worry for large corporations to become heartless on people, which is one of the main problems. Understanding well, the technology. I, if, I, if I may, Mr. Robert, I, I have ambition that uh, uh, many engineers, technicians um, will be required to not only to work in the designs and build um, um, and keep the operations up and running, but the rest of the people might not have been able to, to work in it somehow, I guess. Okay, so Ramon, Ramon, you're addressing your concerns to me about will AI uh, kill jobs? And the simple answer is yes. The not so simple answer is not necessarily. And, I, and I'll explain to you what I mean by that. You see, our analysis of the cost of hemp stock processing says, if you don't do it large volume, you can't make enough margin. And if you're only doing it so that you put stock in one end and you get herd and bast out the other end, you can't make enough margin. So our system allows us to integrate the primary and the secondary processing so we can make more margin and we can make it make sense. So what, were your, what, were your, what was your point? You were asking about the AI and taking jobs. So let me say this, our facility is designed to operate 724. 50 weeks a year. We employ 70 people per facility. Mm -hmm. As I said, all of our people are well paid. And it is my intention to build a community rather than just a company. 
in the rural areas where our types of facility will exist, this is going to be clean agriculture. You know, this is a very sophisticated operation, which only really means that it stays clean because the system looks after itself that way. The people are basically there just to support the system. But the reality is, as you said, you need technicians, you need forklift drivers. And at the same time, we also create 30 to 40,000 hours of trucking. Mm -hmm. These are all real jobs. Yeah. Yeah. And it's 12 months a year. Now, the problem with not liking AI is that if you don't find a way to become more cost effective, then your neighboring countries will. Oh, yes. And suddenly the jobs that you were trying to protect don't make sense anyways, because you can import cheaper than you can produce in your own country. That's the catch 22. So from my point of view, the real need, and, and this is what I love about hemp. You see, I believe that our technology would be appropriate worldwide because every country can grow hemp. Every country can build a hemp industry that will employ people, that will give us hemp for farming. Hemp for farming is good for the soil. Hemp for farming gives us food. Hemp for farming gives us fiber. Hemp for farming gives us construction materials. So I believe that we can build the industry to scale and have everybody benefit, not only here, but everywhere. Mm. In my calculations, using our company as a model, one million acres, one million acres would generate, I believe it was something like 1.8 billion in economic stimulus. Mm. It's a lot of money. <laughs> and yeah, the, the point of the matter is that, you know, people will have jobs um, and, and safety will be improved in our economy, but also in our society. You can't have a safe society when we have environmental realities to the extent that we have them today. You can't ignore the climate crisis. You can't ignore the pollution. These are real issues, and we have a chance to address them in a meaningful way. That's how I see it. And it's no just this, uh, Mr. Robert, to reinforce your point is that, uh, like you said earlier, um, a lot of countries are all working toward the same goal whether they use artificial intelligence or not, for sure there will be countries that are, will be adopting this technology. It, it is unstoppable. And it is uh, from the economics and financial perspective, new industries are highly advised that companies invest in technology and the better technology, the better for the company. So yes. I agree with you. I think, um, and this will bring us to our last question, Mr. Robert. I believe that somehow, um, and that's why my motivation on the artificial intelligence support for the hemp industry, that will accelerate somehow um, the self-sustainability self perspective on green economy idea. And um, what do you think? Well, forgive me again, Ramon, what's the question that? This last, um, that drive us to our last question. Yes. That um, uh, the artificial intelligence will uh, help to accelerate the self-sustainability idea and or the circular economy perspective. What do you think? Uh, I think it goes without saying um, I think, so first of all, let me tell you that I sit on the board of a public AI company. And one of the things that I kind of enjoy telling people at this point is that AI is kind of finished. You see, 
the the underlying architecture of the AI logic has been very well defined and very well developed. The standards that they use are pretty well in place. Everything now with AI is about application. And, and this, there's a significance to this. The significance is that the other side of the new AI world is the blockchain world. And the blockchain world is designed to give security. AI is designed to give data flexibility. And one of the issues has been that when data is in a blockchain, traditionally, AI could not access it because that's the whole idea. It's a secure environment. Mm. They now have a new form of technology called a data trust. And the data trust gives you the flexibility of the AI with the security of the blockchain because it gives you very formal, very formally defined access to specific elements of data in a blockchain. And because a blockchain has two elements of identical data so that one can't be changed, it's a safeguard that you can never corrupt the blockchain with this AI capability. That's a data trust. Now, we utilize data trust in a number of our system applications because we want that flexibility. AI will, in fact, facilitate um, regenerative agriculture, sustainability, the circular economy, because within the AI is the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And within the blockchain comes the ability to have full traceability. So now we can actually trace whose farmer's field that stock came from, which manufacturer processed it, how was it shipped, who received it. All of this data gets compressed down into the blockchain. That's why it will accelerate it because now it can be monitored and measured. There's an old expression, that which doesn't get monitored, doesn't get measured. Mm. Now we can monitor it, we can measure it, and because we can measure it, we can analyze it. Mm. And we can see where we're going off course. Were we 60% effective, 80% effective? We don't need to work it out anymore. The AI will tell us. The AI will also not just tell us what we did wrong, but what we should improve statistically, what would make the best return for our improvements? Which is another universe, my man. <laughs> in, your, in your vision, how long do you think uh, we will be looking at our first factory? Well, the reality is that the, uh, the Cortication line, the company that we work with is Cretus out of Belgium. Mm -hmm. uh, the line that we're talking about is a seven ton per hour, expandable to 10 ton per hour. Uh, that line will take 16 to 20 months to have built and sent over to North America and installed. Mm -hmm. um, because of the timing of uh, making contracts with farmers for supply of stock and what they're going to plant, it's more realistic to assume that we will be serving the crop of 2023. Well, then 2023 is the day that we should be monitoring from now on. Uh, you know what, we might be lucky and get to 2022, but we'll take it as it comes. Uh, I think it's very important in order to give farmers confidence and users confidence, that we don't stumble out of the gate, that when we do come out, we do it properly and we do it smoothly and we do it properly so that it benefits our end users. Otherwise they'll lose confidence. What I was seeing last night uh, from your vision, um, a presentation that I have been promoting for Hempcrete Crete Homes, what I see is um, a factory delivering the herd 
Okay, in this case, we're talking artificial intelligence from downstream. Uh, looking up upstream, we can have factories fully automatized to deliver hempcrete homes, transportable homes for homeless, for, for people that do not have um, enough income to buy large homes. Um, and that, that, in my understanding, it can, it can be a good solution that could, be, could accelerate production. It is my thinking, Mr. Robert. It would not only accelerate production, it would change the opportunity. You see, something that I keep telling people is technology redefines marketing and thereby redefines the economics. Mm -hmm. Because suddenly when you can produce something cost effectively, it becomes a possibility and it becomes something that's marketable. So it's a whole new product that gives all kinds of new benefits to the people who buy it. So I definitely think that uh, the ability to bring down the cost of processing hemp is going to be critical in ensuring that hemp is affordable and marketable and that it becomes well accepted uh, in the market in general. That um, brings me a lot of joy. We share a lot of common thinking and vision. That we do. Yes, and I'm very, very happy, Mr. Robert, uh, having interviewed you in, uh, for him engineering uh, in, and his audience. Could you like My to pleasure. add something Thank else, you, Mr. Robert, to the audience in, in your No, speech? just that, uh, you know, I, I came across your work uh, on LinkedIn, and I'm very impressed with the types of uh, vision that you are sharing with the people on LinkedIn and uh, the areas of interest that you have truly are areas that I share with you. Thank you very much. Um, something that we both share with the heart and the same passion. Amen. Amen. All the best to you, Ramon. We'll speak soon. Be well. Very well. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.